that the king of kings, the one who had been announced, uh, comes from the tribe of Judah. We have been studying in the second chronicle. And the book of second chronicle, there are two important themes. The first one is God's covenant with David. And this is, we're going to, to Christmas based on that faithfulness. The book of Chronicles is just showing us how God has been faithful, even though when we were not faithful. He has been faithful to his promise. There will always be a king that will rule from the descendants of David until Jesus Christ uh, would come and would rule the world forever. And he would come. And I was just reading a text this morning in Micah. As for you, Bethlehem of Ephrata, even though you remain least among the clans of Judah, nevertheless, the one who rules in Israel for me will emerge from you, from the clans of Judah. His existence has been from antiquity, even from eternity. And we are talking about the Lord Jesus Christ who has come. And uh, again, I come back to the book of uh, Second Chronicle because this is the faithfulness of God, an expression how God has been faithful. And uh, one of the, se the second uh, important themes is the temple. The temple is, uh, has always been a very important theme uh, in the Second Chronicle. The temple of God is the main location of interest. David planned the, the, the temple. Solomon built the temple. Kings have been crowned in the temple. Prophets have been killed at the temple. And the law is rediscovered at the temple. So it is so important. And the building of the temple by King De Solomon is the centerpiece of Second Chronicle. And uh, just to review a little bit uh, what Solomon said and what he thought when the, the temple was being built in the next uh, slide. And the house which I am building is great, for our God is great above all all gods. So great is God above all other gods. So that's why Solomon made so many details, so, so many ornaments, so many beautiful uh, crafts and uh, workmanship and all this. It was so beautiful and glorious because it was to honor God. Amen? Hallelujah. But Solomon, when he, 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 he planned the temple, he never conceived it as a place where God would be confined into. The temple is not a, a place you, like a box where you put God in because God is bigger than everything. Cannot, the universe cannot sustain him. And he knew that. But it is a place for us to go. It's a place where we can focus. It's a place where we can have community. It's a place where we meet the Lord. It's, a me it's a, like a meeting point. So it is very important. And Solomon, when, when he was praying his wonderful prayer, he did expect God to manifest his presence in this house. It's like the God that you and I serve, that we know, uh, that we believe in. He's a personal God. He's, he's powerful. He is loving. Uh, he, we, we read in the uh, Hebrew that we do not have a, a high priest who cannot sympathize with our needs, with our suffering, with our pain. We have a God who sympathizes, who understands, who is with us. He cares for us. So Solomon did expect God to manifest his presence when w the people of God would go there to pray and his name. And God did manifest his presence. Actually, God uh, answered Solomon's prayer. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. God approved a place of prayer for his people, a meeting point. For now, I have chosen and consecrated this house so that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And it is such a powerful statement. God wants to be with his people. God reveals, God spoke and he declared, this is special when my people will go to my house of prayer and pray, my ears will be attentive. And it is something that we need to, to keep in mind. The temple will be a place of worship, a place of prayer, a place to seek forgiveness, a place to seek blessing, 
and it is where God promised that he will live. So every time we go, of course we know we live in the New Testament, and Jesus says there will be a time when my people will not worship here in Jerusalem or there in this temple, but we will worship in spirit. God is bigger than the location. But I, th I think we can understand that uh, quite simply this morning. In the Old Testament, they had a temple, a physical location where they would go and meet with the Lord. And it was important, the community of Israel uh, gravitated around the temple. And this temple was also a reflection of the spiritual state and the condition of the heart of God's people. When the temple was... Uh, fix, repaired, and uh, all the, the priesthood was there, the tithes were being br brought, the sacrifice were being offered every day. Uh, it was uh, an expression that God's people were having their eyes on God, they were being obedient, they were seeking God's forgiveness, they were desiring God's blessing, they were seeking their God, they were seeking peace, they were seeking the, the prosperity, they were seeking the blessing and the presence of God to be with them. And I think this is a, a, a truth that is carried on into the New Testament. It's, it's the same. It has not changed. Uh, this truth has not changed. We also gravitate around the temple as Christians. We are the church of the Lord. If you go to the next uh, uh, sets of slides, uh, we, we read that just, uh, just like them, we are God's people under the new covenant. In a way, we also gravitate uh, around the house of God, around the local church. We go to the local church. We are part of the body of Christ. The church is the, 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 the body of Jesus Christ. We are members of his body. Uh, we belong there. Uh, we form the house of the Lord together when we come together. So in 1 Timothy 3.15, so that you may know how to behave. And God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of the truth. In 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, however, you are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. What, these terms were spoken of the Old Testament in the book of Chronicle in the Old Testament, but they are also spoken in the same way to us in the New Testament, the believer, the redeemed. These are the same terminology applied to us. We are royal priests of the holy nation, a people who belong to God. You and me, us here, we were chosen to tell about the excellent qualities of God who called us out of darkness and to his marvelous light. Once we were not part of it. We didn't belong there. We were Gentiles. Uh, but Jesus Christ came and he died for us. But now we are the people of God. Once we were not shown mercy. We were outside of, of that. But now we have been shown mercy. And just as the king of Judah in, in the Old Testament and the book of Chronicles, they chose some good some kings were declared good, they pleased the Lord, because they were seeking the Lord. And other kings did, did evil, and they did not seek the Lord, but they forsake the Lord. So it's the same, we continue. Their action showed their hearts. They showed the condition of their heart toward God. They sought the Lord, it showed what their heart, but they did something. When they were seeking the Lord, and we will talk about it in just a moment, when they were seeking the Lord, they, they chose a course of action, a lifestyle, a way of life uh, to, to, to do certain things. They showed some characteristic that has uh, revealed to us that they were truly seeking the Lord. And we will try to apply some of these to us this morning. And when they forsake the Lord, they also chose a course of actions and a way of life. And their conducts also reveal that they were not seeking the Lord. So actions speaks louder than words many times. And our actions and these characteristics, are they in our lives? What do they reveal? If we would uh, look at our way of life or actions or conduct and uh, relating to, to God's church and and to God's presence and God's word, what would it reveal about us? So I want to highlight four characteristics that 
reflect when the heart is wholly devoted to the Lord. Four characteristics that we should have in our life as well, that we should recognize in our life. And also when, it applies also to someone who has been walking away from the Lord or drifted away or cool off or disobeyed or whatever it is, been unfaithful, but they chose to come back to the Lord because with the Lord, the Lord is merciful and He, he, he always invites people to repent, to come back to us. So, so there are some characteristics Characteristic. The first characteristic that I want to talk about is abandoning idols, uh, because I'm also referring to the book of Second Chronicle and applying to us. And we, we read in that uh, text here, during Rehoboam's reign, the people of Judah did what was evil in the Lord's sight, provoking his anger with their sin. For the also build for themselves big and shrine high places where they worship uh, idols. So, so that is what they did under this king. They forced, uh, forsaken the Lord and they built places for their idols. They went after their idols. What is an idol? To us, it's not only an image where we also, of course, we also oftentimes uh, refer to some of the older, more traditional churches where they, they, they prostrate before a statue or, or images and they pray to them or something, but it's so much, much, so much different than that. It's anything that will replace God in our life. Uh, anything that we will depend upon for our security or for our contentment or satisfaction outside of God, like saying to God, God, I cannot get it from you. I prefer to do it on my own. Uh, this will bring me more satisfactions than you, this kind of things. And uh, when God is neglected uh, in anyone's life, they will forcibly always be something else that you will attach yourself to because that's, that's how uh, human being we are. So when we neglect God, we will forcibly turn to something else to satisfy our impulses, our pride, our selfishness, things like this. So Colossians chapter 3, 5, I want to draw your attention to that text, the New Testament. So put to death your worldly impulses, sexual sin, impurity, passions, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. So it's, 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 it's I was go going to say funny, but it's not the right terminology to say in this one. It is sometimes a bit surprising. Why is uh, uh, idolatry uh, applied to these here? And I also included, uh, maybe more from the King James or older Bible version, some other way to say the same things, because these are translated from the original uh, language. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So why are these things idol uh, called idolatry? Remember the Matthew chapter 6, when it says that someone cannot serve both God and mammon, or he will serve this one or this one, or he will attach himself to this one or to that one. You cannot serve both. In that sense, when you, when you read this text, we start to understand why the term uh, idolatry is being applied to that, okay? And uh, in this text, God is not against sexuality, of course. It's not about sexuality because God is blessing sexuality uh, in the confines of marriage as he has instituted uh, between a man and a woman uh, and the security, the safety, and the loving context of marriage. But here we talk about sexual gratification, uh, perversion, lost, uh, ev e e an evil way like a, there's a line, there's a line where it becomes perversion and it goes. Uh, actually, covetousness, we know what it means. The word means who must have more. There is no satisfaction, there is no contentment, there is no, never enough of this. So if you think of the Ten Commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not, uh, you know, this, and, and all of these can be uh, related to covetousness. You should not murder, 
because you want to have more, so you want to kill this one, so to have your right. Uh, you should not steal uh, because you want more, so you, it gives you a right to steal. You should not covet your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's possession. Why? Because you want more for yourself. So we can see how it all fits, fits together in, in this one. Always wanting more. It's a seeking outside of God what only God can give to satisfy us. But it's, we, we are not looking to God, we are looking to our selfish and to our passions and to, and actually there's a word there about passions uh, that we see in this text. It's actually a very interesting word. It's a pathos, it's like suffering. It's like a, when there's this craving that hurts, you are sick, you remember when uh, one of the son of David uh, was sick for his sisters because he thought he loved, but it was so much sexual perverted passion. He was sick for her and then he committed uh, incest with her as a result of that. Uh, so, so that's this kind of, uh, of, of things here that, that we talk about that. So when the Lord says you should work six days, not seven days. Why do you want to work seven days? Because I can get more or something like that. So all of these things go like, like this. So when we, we think of that, there is an abandonment of idols and we turn to God and we find, we find peace, we find satisfaction, we find contentment. And it, this, these things are being resolved uh, when we turn to God. So abandoning idols, whatever are these impulse and passions is one characteristic of a heart that is devoted to God, always. And we will see something else a, a little bit further that connect with that. Number two, a renewed zeal for God. It's, it's kind of uh, connected. You abandon uh, the idols because you have now a newfound zeal, a renewed zeal. So if we go to that. They entered, it is under King Asa, they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, with all their heart and soul. They agreed that anyone who refused to seek the Lord, the God of Israel, would be put to death. They shouted out their oath of loyalty to the Lord with trumpets blaring. Here you see the return to the Lord. Returning to the Lord is the same expression as repentance. You return to the Lord. You, you repent and all of this. So repentance should be part of the characteristic that we have, a return to the Lord. And this will always produce a renewed zeal for the Lord because it will be motivated by gratefulness. Uh, we will want to please the Lord because he forgave us, like we, we are at peace with him. We discover how good he is. We, we taste of his goodness. So we are so filled with uh, contentment and joy that we are renewed with a sorts of a zeal inside. It's burning inside you want. Uh, maybe some of you can identify with that, but if you look back at the early stage for some of you uh, that you were Christian, Maybe you will remember some of the fiery passions that you had for the Word of God, for evangelism, for, uh, you know, no, the, you, you were looking for God or prayer more or things like this. There was a fire. I remember for my, myself, we were a group of young people in our church and we just read the Bible together. We prayed together. We, we never had enough. We, we always wanted more of these things. So, so the uh, repent Sometimes we always do that. You want to get involved. You, you want to be there where the action is. You, you want to be part of what the church is doing. You want, to, you, you want to serve, you want to make a difference. So that is something that we should see in our, in our lives. Of course, uh, when we talk about a, a covenant, a return to the Lord, we should remember that in fact for us, it is the Lord Jesus that made a covenant for us. It's not us, who, who, like, because in that text, they pledge a covenant. But we saw many times in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, and that they pledge, but they don't keep it, because they could not really keep it. But uh, with the Lord Jesus, it is Him 
who came to make a covenant for us to welcome us, not based on our, you know, remember when Peter says, Lord, I'm ready to die for you? And just uh, hours later, he denied Jesus. So that is how we are. Jesus brought them to the garden of uh, Gethsemane to pray for one hour. They all fell asleep. Uh, so that, this is the, the, the flesh is weak. The, the, we want to, but the flesh is weak. But with the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the one we establish this covenant for us and it is not based on how strong we want to be for the Lord by our promise because we might not keep it but the Lord Jesus will bring us he has entered into a covenant a relation with the father and the father with us and with him so this is a new covenant the king uh, last week we finished with uh, the part where the evil queen Atalia was put to death and the little boy, uh, Joash, who became the king at the age of seven years, came to be a king. But he was being helped by this uh, man that we don't know a lot of things about him, but a very faithful priest, uh, Jehoiada. And uh, it says, uh, I don't have it in the text, I think here, but he made a covenant between himself and the king and the people that they would be the Lord's people. And all the people went and demolished the temple of Baal, and kill the priests of Baal. So when I talk about zeal, renewed zeal, they were, they were serious about returning to the Lord. They were expressing their zeal to the, the fiercest way. They, they destroy the temple of Baal and they return to the Lord, to the true temple, and they kill the, the priests of, of that one. And then... Uh, then right after that, Jehoiada then assigned the duties of the Lord's temple to the priests and the Levites. So there's a restoration. There's the negative. We, we destroy the idols and then we reorganize. And then we, we go back to do the things that God wants to do. There's a zeal. There is a desire to do that. Number three, joy will fill the height. Uh, Second Chronicle 15, 15. Uh, all Judah were happy about this covenant, the one that we talked about just before that, the, that they, they promised publicly and everything, and they were happy about this covenant for they had entered it into, uh, into it with all of their heart. They earnestly sought after God, and He, God, allowed them, because they, they searched for Him, God allowed them to be found by them. Uh, by, they, they could find God and the Lord gave them rest all around this is blessing following after that there's always blessing uh, earlier in that chapter God had promised King Asa if you seek him he will be found by you so that the prophet had come to speak these words and that verse is the fulfillment of that promise there was a sincere and a true joy of being fully committed to the Lord. There's something that happens in the heart when you recommit, when you go back to the Lord, when you return. You, there is something. Uh, and when they made this covenant, they made this covenant together and they made it publicly and this way they made each other accountable. They even said, if we don't follow this, this uh, covenant, we will be put to death. So that, that this, to show their seriousness and their accountability, there's a community action over there. The people of God did it. They shouted their allegiance to the Lord. They made it clear, public, loud, and clear, and being accountable to the Lord. And then it brought joy. Uh, last Wednesday night, we had a wonderful uh, uh, Christmas uh, evening at the Wednesday night group. And there's a, a, a newer believer that was with us, and uh, we were sharing a few things. And he said that uh, uh, a few months ago, just quite recently, uh, after w the Wednesday night group, uh, we, we discussed with him, and he started to read some parts of the New Testament. And, and that, he decided that he is going to pray every day. Uh, before he goes to work. He, he's, this is new. It was new to him. He's a new believer. So I'm going to put in practice and I'm going to pray every day before I go. And uh, he started to be faithful and to pray. And then he, he shared with us last Friday night, uh, last Wednesday, 
that he, he, he had a problem with someone in relationship with someone and it was heavy on his heart and one of his prayer was that it would be solved and someone in the group had advised him uh, and then he prayed and his problem with that person was being resolved and you should see his face and the joy when he was sharing I I decided to pray every day and I had a problem and this is how the Lord has uh, answered my prayer there was great joy Amen. and uh, this this is how how Christian life sh should should be there is a moment of joy always a renewing of of joy when we go the joy of turning back to God can be experienced the realization of forgiveness the reconciliation the closest with God worship also bring joy. That's why coming to church on a Sunday morning, I think that worship can really bring joy. When you read some of the words and you declare it and you worship, sometimes, sometimes it will be tears. Uh, so I'm saying joy, but then it is tears. But it's not tears of despair. It's like tears when your your emotions are being touched. You feel a connection with God, and it does something to your emotion. Uh, so it is it is very important. Worship brings joy, a sense of personal connecting with our personal God. That's the that's the beauty of Christianity. We're not worshiping the cosmos, or we're not being reincarnated and some. Something. We are just having a God who came as a man to save us, to bring us to him in a place, to be with him an individual, a, God, a, a person a, with a personality. And we, we, have, we have this God, our living, our loving Heavenly Father. The Lord also, in that text, blessed them. Be blessed those who wholeheartedly will follow the Lord. Verse uh, 20, uh, 27. Then they all returned with joy to Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat, the king. That's another part of the story in Second Chronicle at their head. And I want you to look at this beautiful statement. Because the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. I think this is significant. When I read that yesterday, I, I says, yeah, I want to stop on that and uh, meditate on this because the Lord has made them to rejoice. And I think there's, there's different kind of joy. Yeah, human uh, joy, human satisfaction, uh, laughter, uh, a joke. You know, there, there's different degree and the different forms of, uh, uh, of joy and expression of joy and things like this. But there's one kind that is unique, is the joy when the Lord make you experience that level of joy. And that kind of joy should be experienced by, by Christians who, who wholeheartedly are connecting with the Lord and worship. It is a work of the Lord in the heart. It, it's the result of something else. It's like a grace or a gift that is imparted to you from the Lord. It says, you want me here. Feel. Feel my presence. Feel what it is to connect with me. Feel that you belong to me. Rejoice. Be content for that. And I think it's really important. And uh, next uh, slide. I just wanted to bring a text that I came to mind yesterday that is in the New Testament, the book of Romans, that kind of summarize everything we've said so far. The zeal, the abandoning the idols, the serving the Lord and the joy and everything. Be devoted to each other like a loving family. We are a loving family. Do not lack in zeal. Be enthusiastic in spirit. Serve the Lord and rejoice in hope as a, as a result. Let your hope keep you joyful. Just just follow the Lord. Just connect with your f church family. Express love. Uh, and you will feel a lot of things from the Lord. And I want to close with the number four. The heart becomes generous. Because you see it all over the New Testament, the Old Testament. You see that, that aspect of... Because I was saying in the opening statement that the temple is a symbol of God's relationship and our relationship. The way we treat the temple, the way we neglect the temple in the Old Testament is a symbol. It reflects the heart. And I think it is true. It remains true. We, we may abandon the church 
we may abandon prayer and the Lord. We may seek the Lord, and it, it will be uh, reflected. The heart becomes generous. When the heart wholeheartedly seek the Lord, the heart becomes generous. When the leaders and the people return to God, they first care for the neglect of God's house. That is often uh, a, a pattern in the Old Testament. There's neglect in the house of the Lord. Then someone godly comes, sees that, is horrified, realize what's happening, and then. And I want to, to say something because many times, if the heart is not wholehearted uh, devotion to the Lord, you don't even see that the Lord needs, that the, the temple needs repair. It's, it's like you are blinded. You are not aware of that. You are, don't even recognize that uh, a change, uh, a participation, a, a repair, that the, the church needs you or something. You don't care? Not because you don't care. It's because you are not aware, because you don't see it. Your eyes must first be open to see the need so that you may become the solution of that, of that need. Otherwise, you don't see it, so you cannot feel for it or do anything. So one uh, characteristic that you see when the heart return to God, the eyes are open, and then you see the condition of the temple or the condition of the community, the Christian community, or the condition of, of, of our life, because we are also, our body is also the temple of the Lord. The, the togetherness of the family of God, we are also the temple of the Lord together. So. So when our eyes are open, then you start to recognize there is a need. There is, uh, uh, something is broken. Something has been damaged. Uh, something bad has happened. So we need to, we need to do something about that. So uh, I just wanted to this, end the, this text. And last week we were uh, going around this, this theme. The children of uh, Atalia, or the sons of Atalia, that wicked woman, had broken into the house of God and had even used all the dedicated things of the house of the Lord for the bowels. So that's what, that, that's why we left last time. It's damaged, it's broken, they broken in two, they took some of the holy things that belongs to the worship of a true God and they used it and they damaged the temple. So it's, it remained like that until King Joash one day just says, we need to repair the house of the Lord. We are God's people. We cannot leave the house of the Lord like that. I think this, this is very, very significant for us. This explains why the temple was in such disrepair. We read also in the same chapter that they abandoned the house of the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and served the sacred poles and everything. So there is an abandonment of the house of the Lord, a neglect, it gets broken, and then we turn and we worship something else, whatever it is that we have. So then that text here that you see, the king ordered the Levites to make a box. I think that's very good today because we are going to our AGM, and I, I think this, this is a very close to what our, the goal of a, a AGM should be like. And also, I think this is the Old Testament equivalent of Acts chapter 6, when they were uh, going to distribute and they need to organize, they need to be fair, and the distribution of food for the Christian. I think you see organization, you see administration, you see gifts, you see the height of the people coming together. The king ordered the Levites to make a box of, for contribution and to place it at the temple gate. Then all the leaders and all the people rejoiced. Ah, the joy again. They brought their contribution and filled the box with it until all of them had given. When they saw that there was a lot of silver, the royal scribe and the accountant, ah, the accountant is there, of the high priest emptied the chest and then took it back to its place. They went through this routine every day or day after day and collected a large amount of silver. The king and Jehoiada gave the money to the construction supervisors who hired 
masons and carpenters to restore the Lord Temple. You see all the organization, the planning, everything works together. They rebuilt, the men in charge of the work were diligent and the repairs progressed under them. They rebuild the temple of God according to its original design and reinforces it. They, they strengthen it. They measured it. They did it exactly as the original measurement, the blueprint, and they made it strong. They really built it uh, well. And uh, they rebuild. Okay. When they had finished, they brought the rest of the money before the king and Jehoiada, and they made from it, there was an excess of money. And they made from it articles for the house of the Lord. I think that's a wonderful place to, to look at this morning. Under the direction of King Joash, the priest gave an opportunity to give to the people. Because in God's people, people should have an opportunity. And that thing that has been a practice in Lighthouse that started with Pastor Steve when he was there. Not to make emotional appeal and everything. I remember the principle that uh, Pastor Steve uh, sh uh, shared with us. Uh, there is a giver and there is a need, whether it is a missionary or anything, and there is God. So many times what we see is the, the giver, uh, the, the, the one in need, is asking emotionally to the giver, please give me because I am so much deed. But actually the pattern is the, the, the giver prays to God and the, the one with need prays to God. And God is the one who impressed the heart of the giver to give to the one in need. And that is a much better uh, principle. And we see this kind of thing. So, the, so we should have opportunities to give and to support presented because some of us are ready. Some of us have generosity. And some of us uh, have connected with the Lord. And we, we are liberal about that. Then another thing in this story, they place a collection chest or box and a strategic location. It's something new that had not been done. The temple had been uh, damaged. It, it, they broke into, they, they stole the, the things and that. So they put a box where people would walk in and out and a strategic location because it was priority. It was an important project for the people. So they wanted it to be visible and to be there. God could have caused the money to appear. Okay, God is, can do miracles, but God chose to work through his giving people. It's, it's a pattern that we see in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And it reflects Second Corinthians 9, 7. So let each one give as he purposes and his heart, not grudgingly, but as, uh, or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And this text also, you see that not only God cares about uh, uh, generous givers, that we will give generously, but he also, and I think that's important for our AGM, he also cares that the gifts given will be uh, diligently administered, as you can see in this uh, wonderful text here. And I think in this text we find what every Christian organization needs. Good organization, good administration, accounting, management, faithfulness, the hiring of right workers for the repair, the maintenance of God's house. It's all there. And then they brought the rest of the money before the king and Joyada because the people have been generous. They have excess so that they can do even more. They can buy equipment. They can buy utensils. They can, for that will be used for the rest of the budget of, of, of the church. So this was a wonderful expression of God working and working with his people. They had come together, they gave generously so that the house of the Lord would be repaired. And closing last sets of scriptures, talking to us about being God's people, you too, as living stones, are building yourselves up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. It's good to be re refreshed and reminded of who we are or what we are to be like a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, so that we may offer spiritual sacrifice that are acceptable 
to God through Jesus Christ. Because money is important. Actions is important. Conduct is important. It's part of being spiritual. And it cannot be just done without care, without heart. Uh, you don't approach, approach God just like with uh, uh, laziness, uh, negligence, mediocrity. You, you approach God with, with the best that is within you, knowing who He is. He is holy, He is pure. He wants, he, wants, he wants our heart so that we can offer a spiritual sacrifice. We need to examine our hearts as well. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers or foreigners. You are citizens along with all God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are His house, becoming a holy temple for the Lord also being made into a place where God lives through His Spirit. That is our identity, that is why we exist, and that is why we practice uh, the way we do. Uh, we love the Lord, and we want to return to the Lord, we want to seek the Lord so th that He can uh, uh, allow us to find Him and follow the pattern. Amen. Father God, we thank you this morning for this uh, wonderful church family, local church. We are your people, the people of God, and we want to live as such, and we want to glorify your name. In Jesus' name, and everyone says, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So, officially, our service would finish now, but we ask you, please be patient.